everyone, welcome to Somerset House. I'm delighted today to introduce Jeannie and Anne Lewin, who is approaching fashion research and styling and sharing it with us. Um, I'll intro um, Jeannie just in a second, but thanks for coming to Somerset House today. This is part of the Upgrade Yourself programme uh, online. So we have both inspiration events and process-led workshops like we are here today. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. So myself and Jeanette are on, this, are on the screen with you the whole time. We do have the chat box, the, the q and I think it's called, just here. So do feel free at any time over the next 90 minutes to put lots of thoughts, questions directly to Jeannie um, into the Q&A section. And then I'm here to help facilitate those questions and bring them back to Jeannie. And hopefully we can have a really great discussion. So as I said, we're looking at research, we're looking at fashion styling, we're looking at publications, lots of different things that Jeannie has done. So I'll hand you over to Jeannie. She's put together some really beautiful PowerPoints and PDFs for us. And we have some film clips as well. So um, welcome Jeannie, how are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm really happy to be here. Um, gosh, I guess I should talk about me a little bit, um, which is always yes. something that's tricky. Um, right, I should share my screen. That's what I'm going to do first. Fabulous. Um, Thanks, Jenny. Take it away. So I wanted to set, talk about where I started from. And I, um, God, I've been in the industry for about, about 10 or 11 years now. I'm really showing my age there. But um, the first person I assisted was Isabella Blow. Um, who was an amazing fashion editor who discovered the likes of Alexander McQueen, Fit Tracy, Sophie Dahl, um, Stella Tennant, everybody. Um, you can see pictures of her here. That's here her with um, Philip Tracy. That's an amazing editorial that she did. Um, and that's her with Alexander McQueen. Um, I went to work at Tatler, um, which is um, an odd publication of choice, but at the time when Izzy was there, it was really interesting because she just took a very unique and different approach to fashion, one I'd never seen before anyway. Um, whenever they would discuss a shoot, like she would just sort of, she'd bring out like an old book full of, um, you know, Caravaggio paintings and be like, I want to do a fashion show or a fashion shoot just based on this. Um, and everybody would kind of look at it and be really confused. I found it very fascinating because I studied art history. Um, that was a passion of mine. Um, I wanted to be an art curator um, and did a very short stint at um, Christie's once I realized that you need lots and lots of money to be an art curator. They don't really tell you that until after you um, you go in and you sort of spend three years studying it, that it doesn't pay that much money because it is essentially designed for people who are very wealthy. Um, hopefully um, that will change. So I sort of stumbled into fashion, but was really taken with working with Izzy because she sort of would translate these amazing Botticelli paintings and things that I was very used to, but put them in a modern context, um, which was, something I still I guess apply today. Um, after working for Izzy, I was supposed to be there for two weeks and I ended up staying there for about a year. Um, she called around loads and loads of different magazines and I ended up interning at a bunch of places. Um, one of them was Pop um, with Katie Grand and I then went on, I went, I stayed there for a little bit, sort of flitted around, went to live in New York for a couple of months, that didn't really work out. Um, I worked to interview there. It was it was just a very different fashion scene to what I was used to. Um, I think even today, you know, comparing London stylists and, and American stylists are so we're so vastly different, and our aesthetics are really different. So it's quite a strange place to kind of go and train once you've been working in one place for a number of years. Um, so then I came back. I worked at Love for I think five seasons so it's across around about two years um assisting katie working on everything from front covers like this one to fashion shows ad campaigns really kind of like got into everything um what am i doing now now i do a range of loads of different things so i do a bit of creative direction for um musicians i do ad campaigns um, i sell fashion shoots and i work at a new magazine that katie has started called perfect um, these are the first two sort of teaser images that we've launched in the last couple of weeks which has been very really exciting it feels like i've been working on it forever so it's really strange to see it out and see other people seeing it um, but we're out in march uh, please go and buy it because i want to keep my job 
um, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of like an introduction to me. Um, and then I wanted to show you guys some examples of my work, um, which I will do now. Bear in mind that my, um, my screen sharing abilities are a little bit limited. Okay, so I um, worked on the last issue of Love um, and I shot this with Indigo Lewin, who is a young new photographer who's amazing. She just, everything is so sort of intimate with her, which is really lovely to see in, in, in images in general, but in particularly in fashion images. I just think it's really rare to kind of feel like you're part of the moment, even though you're not in the room. Um, that's kind of why I love her work. Um, I shot this for ID with Campbell Addy, who is an incredible um, photographer. Um, highly re recommend you look up his work. He just has, there's so much sensibility and, and grace and elegance um, with so much ease. It's, it's quite shocking to kind of be around. Um, that was really amazing. We were both, um, we were asked to talk about, it was for ID's 40th issue. Um, and it was all about family and things that mean sort of, you know, what, what family means to people. And um, both Campbell and I are from Ghana. So we uh, wanted to celebrate a incredible um, photographer called James Barner that not many people know about. Um, he's still alive today, he's 90, he lives in England, um, but he was kind of the first photographer to shoot um, people in color in the 60s. And he had all these amazing um, photographers, like photographer friends and like creatives and he wanted to kind of sort of create a bit of like an art house vibe before people kind of knew what art houses were. Um, he was just super modern but some of his pictures are just incredible and when we did this shoot it ended up being in the Serpentine kind of alongside his work just to kind of show you know how much respect we have for him and how his images are still kind of influencing people today. Um, this is a shoot that I did for self-service, which is an impossibly chic French magazine that I um, had always wanted to work for. Um, I got a chance to just shoot people just sort of in character form. So there was no, sometimes you're given a brief and then sometimes someone just goes, can you go and get some nice clothes? Which is what I did. Um, and it was really amazing. We did stills and a video. Um, and the video is just like really sweet. It's just kind of like lots of people being funny and moving around and um, just, yeah, it's really, really great. I might show you that later, actually. Um, this is for Nylon, hey, which is one of the first... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Ginny, yes. I don't want to interrupt you. We actually, we can't, you're not sharing your screen. Um, we could hear the... Am I not? But yeah, we don't know if you were waiting to upload, but yeah, it's not came through. So maybe we can just look back at the screen if that's okay. Just sorry, everyone watching, we've just got a little tech here. Oh, sorry. I've been running. Oh, here they are. Crazy. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's cool. I don't want to can... interrupt your flow, but um, that's as we can see. Where, where... Oh, okay, right. So the first one I'm going to try and do is in a way that makes sense. The first one <laughs> was, was for Love Magazine. <laughs> that was for um, Indigo, that was with Indigo Lewin, um, who is a young photographer that I've recently just started working with, but I was talking about her love of intimacy and how, you know, you kind of look at her pictures and feel like you're in the same room, which is really lovely. Um, this is with Campbell Addy, and it's a shoot that's inspired by a Ghanaian photographer called James Barner that I encourage everyone to go look at. I think his um, exhibition is still in the Serpentine now. So, um, if not, you should definitely try and look at some of his work. It's just really, really beautiful. Um, he was one of the first black photographers it, to come to London in the 60s and shoot a bunch of people. He did like kind of street photography and he'd just find people in like colorful outfits or anything that he found interesting and would take photos. Um, this is for self-service, which is a French magazine that I'm really into. And I got a chance to kind of, we had like five characters to come in on one day and we just sort of, they came in, I sort of looked at them and said, oh, would you like to wear this? And that's how the shoot kind of came together, which was really nice, actually. Um, Character-based fashion shoots are sort of my favourite thing to do, um, just because it feels, I don't know, it feels a bit more real, placing people to outfits rather than 
creating whole stories that don't necessarily feel universal, but maybe that's just my point of view. Um, this is for nylon that I shot a few years ago, actually, in Margate um, on a sunny day. Um, nylon was one of the first magazines that ever kind of let me shoot for them. After I was an assistant, you kind of emailed people constantly being like, hi, I'd love to shoot something. You never get a response. And they were the first people that were like, well, yeah, OK, you're in England. Maybe you could shoot this. And it worked really well. And I shot for them for about, God, three years, I think, on and off. Almost every month I would do something like for one of their main fashion stories. Um, this is another shoot I did with um, a guy called Danny Cassari, who is great like he's really having his moment now he just shot the cover of british gq he does v magazine he's doing all these great things and we shot this in hackney marshes really early in the morning um just before christmas but we had to try and make it look autumnal but still quite sunny <laughs> which was quite quite a hard task when like you know you can't see it in the pictures but there was snow around <laughs> um but yeah it was it was it was fun that was a really fun day um, this is a project I did with Metal Magazine. Um, they asked us to recreate um, old ads, and this is a recreation of a Donna Karen ad. Um, I wish I, I should have got the picture up against it. In this Donna Karen ad, um, Karen ad the it's a it's a female president, and she's surrounded by um, loads of men. And I wanted to spin it on its head, um, but that was quite uh, like. A challenging shoot. Me and the photographer didn't really get along, um, but we managed to kind of make the image work. So I can look at it a lot fonder than on the day. <laughs> um, and to my right is a um, just a graduate special that I did with Felix Cooper a while ago, where um, a lot of MA students needed some imagery for their portfolio and they'd kind of just been beavering away making things but had never seen it on a you know on a human so it was quite a nice experience to kind of do stuff like that um this is some examples of some shows i've styled um this is wesley harriet who is a young designer from london um really interesting i love his play on proportions and his sort of display of femininity um all of his characters kind of look like they should be in an anime or a manga cartoon. And I quite like that element of it, you know? Um, and this is a show that I styled for Fashion East. Um, each year Fashion East pick three designers that they think are going to kind of be hotly tipped. Um, and they, you know, those, the, the criteria is just kind of people submit, they pick who they like the most and those people get to do a show. Um, and that was the first show I styled. This is Yu Hang Wan, who's amazing. Um, and now I wanted to show you a video clip of the presentation. Let's see if I can do this where everyone can see it. Okay, can we see that? Uh, not yet, Ginny, not yet. No? No, it's not. Okay, let's have a look. Oh. So we can hear it, but we can't see it. We can, we can hear it, but we can't see it, Ginny. We can hear it, but we can't see it. Let's try it again. Oh, no worries. Okay, can we see it now? Yes, perfect. Cool. Too drunk, 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 too drunk
Um, so yeah, that was that was like a a really it was fun, but it sort of happened really quickly. It was kind of all you know got the show and then started working on it the next day, and the next thing you know it was an actual show, um, which Gini, was quite Gini, exciting. But yeah. Very exciting. Yeah. Can, can I share about the process, Ginny? Just to interrupt you about Fashionist, for example. Um, so they are like an initiative. They show three designers a year, a season. That's correct, doesn't so they yes. they they audition or select those people. Um, do they contact you to say we'd like you to be the stylist, or do you do you does the fashionist people contact you, or is it a magazine that suggests you, or how what's the process? Basically, I mean, how that went about is they they tend to try and match the stylist to the aesthetic of the designer. So this yeah. designer came in quite late into the process and they were like, we really like this girl. She's really great. And we were wondering if you'd like to talk about styling her show. And are you three, the show's in like four days. And I was a bit like, oh, definitely gosh. three. And we looked at each other's work and really liked it. So it was, it normally when I'm asked to do things, I'm usually asked to do things kind of at the um, sketching stage and at the fitting stage. So yeah. I can kind of make suggestions, sort of, you know, at say perhaps we need to do a different colorway or, you know, we need to like experiment on the fabric here. It might not be a bit stretchy. I could see, you know, you can kind of envisage project problems, but mm. with that, you couldn't really do that there because it was such a late stage. Um, so it's like, we all had to sort of work together really quickly in a way mm. that made sense if that made sense yeah um yeah so is, is that when you would you would you then connect with the makeup artist or the hair stylist as well yeah with, so it's the visual journey on so all, walking and lookbook and stuff yeah we'd all but kind of the same as a lookbook or like maybe like a standard editorial where we'd all put together what we were thinking come up with reference ideas so Yuhan would send me some of her references her inspiration for the show um you know how how her process was of making the piece the garments and then you know what she was thinking for her and makeup and mm. then I would kind of fire back with oh well I was thinking maybe we could do this or perhaps it's you know it's about a red lip or maybe it's about this type of hair or shall we introduce yeah. this and the other it's like a real kind of group effort in terms of the conversation and then we normally have a um a testing day where mm. we get one model to come in we try them on in like maybe three or four outfits and we try the hair and makeup on um this one right. model take a bunch of pictures a bunch of fitting pictures and just see how it works out basically yeah. um and then we go through the stage of you know trying to find all the right models at the right time who fit the clothes in the right way. Um, what was interesting with Yuhan's collection is that her fit model is like five foot three. So it meant that we it's could so only have deep. girls that were a certain height because right. they wouldn't, like when you put a garment on, on someone who's maybe a little bit broader or a little bit taller, it suddenly didn't have the desired effect or it, you know, it hit at the ankles instead of it being like yes. and things like that. Oh, that's so interesting. And then, yeah. It, yeah, we had one, we had, there was one garment that was sort of completely beaded um, and it was like a beaded, almost cage-like sort of dress on top of some mesh, but because it was so fine, we had to make it on the girl that we chose and we didn't choose the girl until like oh. three or four hours before. So as everyone's getting ready, and obviously Fashionist has three different designers, so we're all sharing this tiny space. There's this one model standing there in like a little pair of pants while they're building this dress around her. Um, it's a bit touch and go, quite, quite <laughs> like scary to see. <laughs> yeah, that makes me quite anxious hearing that. Yeah, not great for <laughs> anxiety. people are sewing onto the body. Yeah, there was a lot of that kind of like sewing on just to make, cause you couldn't, basically we tried to try it on and every time you try, tried it on it, it would rip. So then the person would have to start again because it's oh the whole God. thing's just made of beads. So they yeah. were like, we'll just have to sew it. <laughs> how, how do you, can I just ask one more question? Just cause it's, I find it so interesting, the sort of behind the scenes stuff, but how do you find um, like if the designer, like the main, designer whose label is and they they obviously they won't be sitting doing the hand stitching really because they're trying to do everything how do, do you try and keep them calm and then everyone in the team's just feeding in to get the outcome done kind of thing is it yeah it's, 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 very, it's a lot of friends sort of making friends and yeah 
I think the whole thing is that it's it's why I love to kind of get in quite early with a designer is because then you can build a rapport and then the two of you together can be like we're going to be fine right we're going to be fine and you can tackle problems together if you if you kind of don't have that you suddenly come across as like being really over really or being like are you okay can I make you some tea and that person's yeah. like I'm really busy itching please leave me alone <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it's trying to make sure we're all um, working together and helpful rather than the last thing I'd ever want to do is sort of stress out somebody who's already quite stressed. Highly stressed. Um, and somewhat, yeah, that's true. Um, someone's just asked a question. Um, can I just ask you now, Ginny? I know that we're, go we're going yeah. into your presentations, but um, there's quite a few questions coming through. Someone says, um, how does one apply to Fashionist? That's oh, they, like an online yeah, they have a... Uh, if you if you go on their website and on their Instagram each year just before the fashion season sort of kicks off, they take applications. I I'm, and they've got a deadline as well. So you kind of go on, you yeah. show your designs um, and you know examples of your work, and then it goes over to a panel, a whole panel of people. It's quite a large panel, um, mm -hmm. from what I know. And then together they pick the best. But I know so many people will apply for it. Um, but it's a great. It's a great platform. It's a great kind of, yeah, it's a great platform. Really, really great platform. Cool. We can, we can put a link on our web page as well, or post the web page for all that kind of stuff. Um, if there are more questions, just keep coming coming in and I can sort of jump, jump in and out. But sorry to interrupt you, Jeannie. Feel free to. No, no, of course. Um, I can't remember what else. What, where were we? Um, I've shown you. So we looked at Wu we, we, Yang's um, video, didn't we? And then we were going to look at um, your other presentation. Oh yes, that's it. I was going to talk about mood boards and how I make them. Um, right, we're going to try, by the end of this, I'll be a dab hand at um, screen sharing. You'd think I've never used Zoom before and I have to use it every day. So I'm, I'm not too sure what's wrong with me. Anyway, um, I wanted to show this presentation. Can, can everybody see it? Um, of a mood board that I've, I've done. Um, this was just for one a shoot that I'm working on that's going to be out imperfect. I can't show you the, the finishing product, but when you, if you look at the magazine, you'll see these and you'll you'll get where the references come from. Um, the feel of the shoot was it was a bit of a strange process, as in I'd discussed with a, the a photographer one thing. We'd gotten in a bunch of clothes. We'd gotten to the shoot, and then about we were taking pictures and we liked them, but neither one of us couldn't work out what was wrong with the image. Not wrong in sort of like, we hated it, but we were just like, there's something missing from it and I don't know what it is. And it wasn't until we'd kind of thought of a reference that we were like, that's what it is. It's more portraity and it's a little bit more youth driven. So we should go in that direction. So then I'd gone back home that evening and pulled all of the references um, that I felt gave me the vibe that I wanted to envision in the shoot. So I wanted it to feel youthful, quite relaxed, quite nice poses, some of them somewhat difficult, but for clothes to be more of an afterthought than the first thing you see, you know? I wanted it to feel engaging. So all of these images are kind of um, old Italian Vogue, Mario Sorrenti, one of my favorite photographers, um, like really relaxed, vibrant, but without trying. I wanted it to just feel really effortlessly cool um, because the cast that we had were really, they, they were like, everyone was like really young and kind of some people had never had their photo taken before and all that kind of stuff. And I just wanted, I wanted to kind of get people dressed and then leave them to it. Um, so, you know, like we, there was this one kid called Nathan and I, he was in a jumpsuit and I was like, do you want to just go and sit at the corner? And then we just, you know, took the photo and that, that was how it was. It was very, it felt a lot easier um, once you do that, because sometimes people tend to overcomplicate shoots and it doesn't work that way. Um, then I've got another idea. I had another um, idea that I've not pitched to a magazine yet. Can you see this one? 
yeah, it's called, so it's called Goth Prom and I'm quite obsessed with the, I'm really obsessed with old prom pictures. I spend like hours and hours on loads of different websites looking at them. Um, maybe it's because I never went to a prom. I don't know, but I was like, no one's done a story about like a goth prom. Like, do goths go to proms? Is this something I've made up? And I found out that they did. So I was like, oh, we should like try and do, it wouldn't be like great to do some like a modern version of that and see how these characters interact in this sort of kind of cheesy scenario. Um, Cause it is like a prom feels to me like forced fun. It's like, it's on a day, you're gonna wear a dress. You you have this corsage, you, you need to do this, but there's no alcohol. It all feels really strange. Um, and kind of against what you think a quote unquote goth stands for, which is, you know, breaking rules and traditions and stuff like that. But I, I just sort of love these images, you know, like how a, the back combed hair and like the really kind of like serious outfits, um, but then quite like happy, joyous pose, um, pictures, really great. Um, but I found like I'm I'm quite obsessed with you know I really love a good beauty image that's why I picked that one I thought that was incredible the gradient and the makeup is just like really great um, I liked this space and how cramped everybody is but how everybody feels like they're being an individual but they all look the same um, which is something I'm always fascinated by um, I loved, I, I sometimes will, when I'm looking at references, I try and pull from all over the place. So it will, uh, what I normally do is I will go with a mood, pick as many things from it, then put it on a page and make sense of it. Cause that's how my brain works. Other people do it in different ways. So, um, but I kind of just go, right, you know, I, I sort of write down a couple of initial words and then I go for that and build a story around that. Then once I put the images together, I'm like, oh, it's a mood board that makes sense. Um, it's very easy for me to do it for myself, a little bit easier, a little bit harder when I have to do it for like clients and um, particular things because it's a trial and error process. When I do it for clients, I tend to, I ask a bunch of questions um, and ask them kind of almost what their limits are, how far they want to go. Um, when you image research, you kind of go all over the place, you know, so you'll start with one thing and then you'll sort of end down, you'll end up in so many different rabbit holes. Um, but I just, I just loved just the imagery of this all together and thought I'd pull in some like film stills as well. Um, that's Junior, that's Junior, can I ask? So, is film quite a big reference point for you and for your research? Because you've got the craft and you've got lots of cool things there. Yeah. Films to get inspired from. Yeah, I um, I love films, like love, love, love films. Um, and and just grew up a bit of a loner, out of choice, really. I just kind of really liked hanging out by myself. So I would take myself off to the cinema. I also oh. loved um, reading as well. Mm -hmm. um i used to read point horror books i don't know if anybody ever read them but i, I had like, every I was... single one i had they were very oh, nice i had them all i loved them, them. Best and ever. i think i loved the covers of them as well because it was always like the cheerleader and then it'd be somebody yeah. in this very suggestive outfit dripping with blood and, and you'd be like why does the 15 year old look like that and how has she got a boyfriend <laughs> yeah. and now she's killed the boyfriend. My questions have questions. Yeah. So I think my love of that and cinema combined kind of shaped the aesthetic I have now. Like I used to watch a lot of John Hamm movies. Um, what's his what's his name? Is it John Hamm? Yeah, I think it is. You know, like Breakfast Club, all of you know, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, Teen Witch used to watch it on repeat all the time. Um, and I think that, I that now my tastes are a little bit a bit more educated and you know I look at a lot of world cinema and stuff like that but so I love cinematography mm. um, and it's I think it's really useful when you're trying to do things especially for I style music videos occasionally as well and mm. when you're trying to do things for music videos it's really good to just look up film references there are a bunch of great tumblers as well that just have like the right image at the right time and you know we'll just uh, just they encapsulate feelings sometimes better than a picture will um so i i always i like a mix of that i like you know i'm quite i've been one to been very much known to kind of look on buses and you know take pictures of bits of graffiti someone's written on walls and stuff like that like i think 
I yeah. tend to kind of keep all of those things because I'm constantly searching, constantly looking for things that when I then think about a story, I go into those folders of those images and I can piece together things in order to make, make it a little bit more interesting. Storytelling, um, yeah. Do you think, um, do you, with your back, I would just say there's lots of questions coming in, so I will feed the questions back to you shortly, just yeah, of to cover this part. Um, and also Sarah in the, in the group says that she was a massive fan of point horror as well growing up, so we're not the only two. Not <laughs> just that. They were, they were crazy, they were like the best. Um, I look good. Um, but also there are more participants joining as we're talking, so if people do want to add questions into the Q&A box, please do, and we'll get to them. Yep. But thinking about, Jeannie, your... Um, your background with art history and that kind of studying so that would have been a lot of like reading and critical thinking and then looking at paintings do you think um studying those paintings and looking at those kind of compositions that helped build your aesthetic as a stylist before you went into more fashion led projects yeah i always i wanted to work in fashion i just didn't know how so i kind of put it on the back burner but knew i love imagery more than anything else I was like I like imagery and I like telling stories but I don't have I don't want to tell stories via designing clothes because I don't think I've got that in me like I, I you know what I mean to me a skirt's a skirt um so which is so it's a slightly strange thing to say as a stylist <laughs> yeah. but it's what you do with the skirt is that makes it exciting and like how the whole picture frames together I like looking at the whole thing rather than individual pieces um, mm. in terms of my own shopping that's completely different but in, in terms of if, when I'm asked to do things it's more like yeah let's just get a bunch of stuff together and then tell stories with that um, mm. I love being able to tell stories via imagery so for me it was really it the two go hand in hand like mm -hmm. art history makes complete sense it makes sense now that I do the job that I do because yeah. I spent so much time researching about pictures and I love I always used to love the backstories of imagery as well you know um, mm. especially the renaissance I thought it was really I found it very strange the dichotomy of sort of there was so much corruption but all of this in the name of God which made no sense to me. Um, and it's not until I kind of got older and read more books and just, you know, just how people used art as a form of expression um, mm -hmm. is the same way I'd like to sort of interpret fashion, um, to sort of keep making and keep creating. Um, so yeah, that's, mm. that's, that's really nice. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah. Back to you. Oh, what else? Were, what, what, what other one was I going to show? Actually, we, we did have Body Morph and... Oh, yes, we did have Body Morph. Where is that? Oh, it's here. No, not that one. It's not there. Mm. It's... We've got one comment in from um, one of the viewers. It says that I was a, a prom goth and went to the prom. I'm not a goth now, but would love to assist you on this shoot when it comes up. What a fabulous idea. So you've got lots oh of... My God. I'm glad someone thinks it's a good idea. I was, I keep being like, I just think it's a really good idea. I want to know if other people went. Okay, so this is my body morph PDF that I am still working on. I sometimes I kind of just go down rabbit holes and find um, pictures, and I find series of pictures that I'm really into. Um, and this was one that I really loved and wanted to try and figure out how I could incorporate clothing into i wrote down the artist's name and i have completely forgotten it i don't know where it is but it will come to me eventually but i loved i just loved how the limbs felt endless and i was like i wonder how that would look if you introduce clothes like would that be a good thing would it be bad um and i do this often i've got a folder i'll, I'll show you some other ones i've got folders just full of ideas and i i'm particularly drawn to sort of um you know artist series because I'm always like oh you know what were they thinking how were they thinking and would it how would that be translated now into a photo shoot or a you know a film or something like that like I just think it's incredible like she's got three legs here and you know here you can't tell where she begins and where the, the mirror ends and just the, the way that she's contorting her body as well is just it's really it's very poetic um and I was really into that. There's another one that I've got that I will see if I can find. Um, I really want to um, shave somebody's head 
I, I say this every, every season, I, I say the same thing, and I've yet to find somebody who's able to do it. Um, shave their head. Yeah, or just like, how do I catch, how do I capture the moment? I just can't. Yeah. Mm. Um, That's interesting. Can seem I, to do maybe it. in terms of like working with nude people or um, people that are naked, like that other photographer, is what sort of safeguarding um, from a professional point of view do you have to put in? Or do you, do you have to do disclaimers to photograph that person naked? Or is there a process that you need to show the magazines you're working with that that's, or is it- I think it means, to, I'd have to yeah. show the magazine like what I was working with and if just, you know, whether or not they're into it, to be honest. Because mm -hmm. I just think it's a really sensitive idea. You can't really kind of just, throw those things out there and hope for the best yeah um <laughs> and in, ter in terms of the models do they um if they're up for it then that, that's obviously yeah most of the time when we're doing castings on particular shoots where they where it requires nudity i always ask people you know everyone's obviously they have to be um above the age of 18 and and i always sort of check and check again that, that they're comfortable with it um yeah. i'm not a fan of putting people in situations that they aren't comfortable in. I find it weird when people do. Um, oh, this is the head shaving idea that I had. Let me share my screen again. So I I saw this um, a while ago and I just thought it was so mm. pretty. Like I loved, um, you know, we're, women in particular are very, I think everyone's attached to hair, but I think women in particular are very attached to their hair. I know I am, I feel really weird when I don't have my hair in braids or I have it done in a way that I find complimentary. But I, there's so much freedom in cutting your hair and I would love to try and experiment in seeing that. Um, but like, I just think, isn't it an incredible series of images? Um, and I really wanted to try and I think it's because she's in this ridiculous dress as well it feels because everything sort of like screams pretty but then shaving your head feels like such a masculine act even though that you know itself as a sentence sounds quite silly but um it was yeah it's, it's I've had this idea for years <laughs> and I can never find it's finding the right person at the right time to do it Mm -hmm. so like I'll have a friend I'll you know I'll have a friend and, and they'll be like yeah I keep thinking about shaving my head and then they'll text me and be like I did it and they'll be like shit why didn't I capture it so <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah one day like the stars will align and I'll be able to sort of show this idea off properly and yeah. film it it's um, very powerful isn't it it's like real just yeah of the femininity with the kind of aggressive act or something that comes through yeah it's it, and I just yeah I just find it so lovely and just the way that she's looking at herself is such an intimate moment um, yeah. that captured so beautifully um, but Talks yeah it's, really. it's one of I've been really dying to do um, but that's that that's kind of like when I do my own personal research I just do that I like I've just got I've lit yesterday tried to get rid of I normally work on a really big computer a, a really big Dell I used to sort of game a little bit but I was never very good and yesterday I was like I have to get rid of this computer it's taking up too much space so I that put all of the imagery that I'd found and all of the mood boards that I'd made sort of throughout the seasons because some some of them I pitched to magazines some of them aren't right and then some of them sort of just live in this sort of bank and was going through quite a few of them yesterday being like oh that's a terrible idea oh that's quite good or you know sometimes it's it, you know I fall in love with a set of images but I don't know where what idea I'm doing it just feels quite random um so then I let it sit there for a while um, I used to make mood boards by hand, but now digitally it's just a little, it's a little bit quicker. I'm able um, to sort of get them out a bit better. But I, I love the, pro the process of making um, a mood board by hand is very satisfying. Mm. I think yeah. using the hand, it's kind of because you, you scan and you print and you stick down and then you rescan. Yeah. So it's important. Because I used to, what well, I know, I mean, now I'm really into doing it digitally, but before I used to go to the libraries, get loads of different books, photocopy, scan, bring them all together, then use the digital ones, then put everything on a big board and all that kind of stuff, which is great. But now I don't really have the time to do it, sadly. Yeah. Um, but, you know, 
Well, we'll see. One of the one of the participants called Becca said that the photographs of the hair shaving remind her of Frida Kahlo portraits, which is quite yes. and it connects back to art and sort of that pro that painting that painted approach. Yeah, I really like a lot of my sort of a lot of the things that I like to do tend to always lead back to art pictures and art compositions, just because you know. I spent so much time when I was little I'd go to museums by myself and sort of wander around and mm -hmm. they seem to have really stuck in my head and resonated um, and I sort of pull them out without knowing all the time which is quite nice um, yeah making mood boards for myself is something that I kind of do to relax it's funny once you make mood boards for other people how the elements change a little bit um, and I find the, I, like, I like the process when I get it right. And then sometimes when the, the process, when I get it wrong, it's, it's quite hard because I tend to overcomplicate things. Like I, I literally did one recently for um, a musician. I didn't, I didn't meet a musician at all, but they asked me to do something and they were like, you know, make it really cool. And I kind of made it so cool. They didn't understand it. They were like, I've never seen these pictures before in my entire life. And I was like, oh, oh, oh. But it was too good, it was, was too good. Yeah, because they, they kind of sent me these weird images and they were like, we want it like this, but cool. And like, the images were terrible. So I was like, OK, so let me go. Let me go back to what they were thinking and sent them like these old Italian Vogue references and all that kind of stuff. And they were just like, oh, no, our, the artist isn't going to understand this. And I was like, OK, wow. so I was trying to sort of meet in the middle where you are able to elongate an idea, but not alienate somebody at the same time, um, which That's is lovely. sometimes yeah, sometimes I can do it really easily. And then other times it's like, they really do just want something from Pinterest. <laughs> and, and I've complicated it where I've, I've gone and been like, here's a book from, you know, 1902 that says X, Y, and Z. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's, but, I guess it's finding that middle ground, isn't it? Of the commercial work versus the super creative and how those work, yeah. worked in, in sync maybe. Yeah, I like I've, I've done some projects for some some design houses and that's though I find those scary but like really amazing because they kind of just let you go nuts they go mm -hmm. want something that's a bit 1920s and you go anything else they're like no so you just go mm -hmm. buck wild because all they go art deco and you're like do you mean jewelry do you mean fabric do you mean um, design mm -hmm. what do you mean and then you kind of just give them you, suddenly you've got 250 images and they're like wow um which is quite nice. It's, I mean, it's just how my brain thinks. It thinks about everything rather than just one mm. thing. And I quite like researching for designers because then they, you know, it's, it'll be being into the imagery, the composition, the set design. Then they might be like, oh, that fabric someone is wearing there looks really great. Um, mm. And then when you see the collection at the end, because you don't know how anyone's going to use anything, you're kind of just like mm. sending zip folders and like a, a wing and a promise. And then you look at it and you're like, oh, oh, there it is. And it's in a way that you didn't sort of expect at all. Um, mm. which I love doing. But um, yeah, the yeah. only problem is, is I have to show, sign so many NDAs. I can never show anybody. <laughs> yeah, of course. Them. Yeah. We'll need to read your book one day, Ginny, your expose in your... Uh, Much that's, that's it. I, well, I was a third, I, I, I run a, I make a, a really small magazine called Moodboard because it's based on my love of mood boards. Um, and originally what I wanted to do was to run some of the old imagery that I'd found, but then realized that, that you needed so much clearance on them that it kind of just wasn't mm. possible. Um, so I'm still trying to toy with how I can kind of, I guess if it's all collages then it's fine, but perhaps it might be something like that. It's Does still, it it's still, in, yeah. Yeah. Do, one more question, just um, when you're thinking, when you're working with big design houses and designers and giving that research, do you think about their customer or do you not think about their customer and you just give them the visual journey and the identity and the excitement and then they can they, that's their problem to worry about how they can monetize yeah I, is that is that the way I you work or? i can't sell anybody anything um <laughs> i, I <laughs> can sell you some dreams though and take you on a little journey so that's that's what i tend to focus on okay. i kind of i basically just go here's loads of weird things i thought of in my head that remind me of a subject and then someone goes wow that's that's really crazy because the journey from like it'll start from like i don't know 
a pen to a crown I saw on, mm. you know, a princess in Russia or something, just something really strange to a meme I found that I thought was quite funny to, you know, me walking out of my house and stumbling across a tree with a funny groove in it. Like it's, it's mm. that random. Um, nice. And I love projects like that are my favorite when people just let me go buck wild and give yeah. me very little restraints. Cause then I sometimes think you find the best things, but I also, you know, I respond when people go, we want it to be really specific, but sometimes I have a really bad habit of making up an image that I thought I've seen. And then I spend it like, it'll be two hours for me looking for this image that doesn't exist. And I'm like, no, I saw it. I, I saw it. And then it's like, you didn't see it. You just, that was You dreamed that. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's quite c c cerebral. Is that the word? It's sort of all, all happening within your head. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's quite, like, I mean, it's nice when people ask you to, I think there's a big difference between image researching and then someone asking for your curation of images, because the curation yeah. of images is, it, you know, my curation of images is all over the place and it's like that for a reason. Um, my Instagram is very much based on that. So it kind of, it's on my mood. It's it, I kind of, because I collect pictures all the time, it will be how I'm feeling, how I want to respond to something. If I suddenly decide I'm really obsessed with the color blue, that is all I will put up that day. There is no rhyme or reason. And I quite like that vibe. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, when you're working for clients and particular things, you have to kind of rein it in, narrow it down and sort of be really precise. Because I think too many images make sometimes it's a bit of an overload for people um, and might point you in a direction you don't want to go in. So it, it depends. Wow, it's so insightful. I hope so. And I mean, it, it's, it's, I think for me, image researching has just broadened my eye and it's sharpened it as well. And really kind of like, it's just forced me to look at different things and different people across the globe rather than I want to do an image about, you know, it's like if I wanted to do a tailoring story, I'm not just looking at like images from four years ago. I'm going way back and looking at loads of different things and loads of different artists rather than that way. It sort of keeps it fresh and interesting. And I think when you do then work on final projects, you're a bit more blown away. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's quite nice. Wow. Um, there's, I'm just aware of, there's lots of questions coming in, so I want to give enough time. Yeah, of course. And there's lots of lovely, just lovely positive comments coming in, Jeannie, that I'll share with you afterwards. Oh. And so, uh, do you have, you had a couple more things that you want to share with us before we really focus on the QA? If anyone watching, what is sending their questions in? No, I think, I, I think we should go for questions. I think I've, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's, um, let's cool. So I'll just start whittling through then. Um, so, yeah. one of them, um, has came in and it says, how do you source outfits from designers when starting out as a designer? So how do you source outfits from designers while starting out as a stylist? Maybe that's meant to be. Oh, but okay. Um, oh <clears throat> gosh. I made friends with loads of young designers and then sort of was like, I'm shooting this thing. It's going to be really good. Please can I borrow it for an hour? <laughs> Be yeah. Beg, borrow and steal. Um, I think definitely making friends with young talent is a really good idea because it's mutually beneficial for both of you. Those people usually want pictures and you're able to provide that. Yeah. If that makes sense. That's great advice. And where did you meet these, that, that sort of network, like your peers? Was it kind of, was it at sort of fashion events or? Sometimes it was at fashion events and then sometimes it was just over the internet. It was kind of like, I I just spent a lot of time looking at like designers I like the look of. And then I would just, you know, I would send them an email and say, oh, I'm planning to shoot this with this person. He, you know, I would always make a mood board. So it felt a little bit more enticing and a little bit more proper and ask if I could borrow the pieces, you know, promise to bring, pick them up and drop them off and all that kind of stuff just to make it really easy. Because if you make it really easy for someone, they're more likely to just give you the piece. Yeah, um, that's true. It. If you make it more complicated for someone, why would they do that favor for you, you know? That's true. And often, I mean, I think with even, depending on how big and sort of huge the, the stylists will be or the, the photographers are, you don't pay, do you, to borrow clothes? 
Is that just no, no? You don't because the advertising's in the in the magazine page or whatever. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I mean, if you're doing things for a commercial purpose, then there's obviously always going to be a budget attached, and then you kind of have to pass that budget on to the designer because you're using their clothes, um, right. and that's a more complicated conversation. So don't don't do that. But um, if you're trying to do it, you know to as a form of expression or you want to put it on somebody i think that's a good idea of trying to build a relationship with people and do you, i guess do you think the um like because like years ago before instagram like to be a published magazine was really, really exciting and really important and now if you're on a famous instagram account and they get retweeted and they have two million followers that's also really exciting for your career what yeah you're think... seeing stuff in published print then as opposed to being online with you I, is that a mixture of I love print I, I love print I earn more money from doing yeah. things on Instagram which is really strange oh. to me because print oh, wow. is is my first and and foremost that's that's my love um but people see what I do on Instagram and then they you know I get paid opportunities from that so I think it's trying to utilize both I think it's trying to utilize any platform that you can visually represent yourself on like mm -hmm. to the best of your abilities so for some people it was tumblr um and it definitely was that for me until the nudity thing came in and then that was like i looked at my tumblr and so i i reposted so many nudes that now when you look at the tumblr like half of it's like blank because i was just <laughs> picking and it wasn't you know they weren't sort of it was all like art house pictures and like beautiful yeah. scrub, uh, subjects and stuff like that and i think now that's kind of damaged itself i mean it's still a, such a great source of resource for me but mm. um it's really hard um to do that i think instagram's great if you want to you know some people use i i'm not one for dressing myself up i've done it recently a couple of times and it, it makes me a bit I, I, I'm not great with my own face, great with other people's. <laughs> but I don't know if that's a confidence thing. I don't. I, I just find the whole thing I'm a bit like, oh God, what? No. Um, but other people, you know, have been dressing up themselves and using themselves as sort of editorials. But I also think it's about keeping it really simple, getting some friends together, you know, go out. Well, when we can go outside, go outside and you don't need to borrow loads of things from loads of different people. Like some of the best, some of my favorite pictures don't have that kind of fashion in them you know it's what someone's wearing and how they're wearing it in the situation that they're in you don't have to be in a big old ball gown it's great if you are but it doesn't need to be that you know yeah, that's really that's really wise advice i think um because i think sometimes people I mean, all these kind of instagram channels and they sort of look at influencers and you yeah. look through it, you start to feel quite anxious and you think and even during lockdown i've not had a haircut for a year i've cut my own hair it's an absolute mess but I can't take it too serious because that's just it's the it's the world we're in. I mean, also think about if you think about movies as well. Like think about the Royal Tenenbaums. Um, that movie's incredible. And what Gwyneth Paltrow is just wearing an old fur coat that she that looks like she got it from her nan. And that is <laughs> yeah. like, but you re you remember that outfit like it sticks mm. in your head. And you think about the Adidas tracksuits and that those things are so easily accessible. Um, yeah. One of the first jobs I had was working in a charity shop, and I used to just get loads of pieces that people didn't want. Like, yeah. get them get them home, play around with them, cut the skirt, put a tutu underneath it, and dress up my friends and take photos of them. Um, and that's how I started to, like, understand and really, like, engage with fashion. I don't yeah. think it needs to be the like, all-singing, dancing thing. Um, I think people react to things that look different, especially in this time since we're overloaded with imagery. Yeah. Um, because anybody could put on, you know, like there's a whole there's a whole section of Instagram dedicated to really beautiful girls who all look the same, who are all wearing the same shade of lipstick, who are all dressed exactly the same. And mm. I can't tell one from the other, and I don't necessarily know if everyone should be going down that, you know. Yeah. Could you ring, maybe i guess i like when you said that about the charity shop because um it made me flick through like when you think of carrie bradshaw on sex and city when she has the two two yeah. cool and it's kind of it's all just sort of very it's kind of diy but kind of cool and that's what the designers buy into i suppose because yeah. the coolest i mean the coolest people i've ever met are the people who dress themselves and like they'll turn up to shoots and i give them like the bare minimum i might be like do you want to swap out that leather jacket for this one that's it because i yeah. kind of think style is something that is it's it's something that you have i don't think it's something that you're taught you know it's how yes. you interact with certain pieces i don't think it's this thing of like 
are following certain rules, which is why, you know, I don't work at a magazine that talks about trends because I would, I'd fall flat on my face. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to sell anything. I'd be like, why don't you just wear the shirt that you were wearing last year? It's fine. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. You know, like my, my favorite outfit of mine is I have a Van Halen t-shirt that's got paint, like a paint splatter that I cannot get rid of. Um, that I've had for like six years. I think I found it at someone's house party and I wear it with like Prada loafers and a kilt. Like, mm. and I just mosey around in this weird outfit. You know, That's sometimes insane. I put a jumper on it. Like it's, I, I'm the person that will shop at ASOS and then really expensive places. It just, I yeah. think that's what style is rather than this, you need to be, hit. people who buy stuff in looks, I tend not to trust them. I think it's weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm like, why would you do that? Well, that's weird. That's so funny. <laughs> um, I guess that goes back to your character-based fashion shoots that you were talking about earlier when the women come in. Yeah come in and you, you make a look from who you get to meet in those interactions it's really cool yeah, most, of, most of the time I let people come the shoot that was coming out um for perfect we had I think I shot 25 people over two days 19 on one day and people came in and they were like rails and rails of clothes and I went down all the rails of clothes with them and said what do you like what do you want to wear and then we build an outfit together because if, oh, if you look uncomfortable in the outfit, it shows in the pictures and then I haven't done my job yeah. properly. So. Yeah, totally, totally. It's that lens will catch it. Um, lots of questions, Judy. So one more question is, as a stylist, how do we form our own aesthetic while, while studying for a diverse set of brands and campaigns where they might have their own individual signature styles? So, this is something I that took me years to get. So I know my style and I can articulate my style, but it's looking at somebody else's and being able to replicate that with ease and confidence that um, took me bloody ages to get. So like for a really long time, when I first got into fashion, it was very much thinking about and reacting to what I liked and how I wanted to, um, my images to be represented. And that was just trial and error, constantly kind of like working with different people in different scenarios, producing pictures until it felt right and it felt good and I was like cool that's me the next challenge is to then turn that into something that you can make money out of which was, which meant I would have meetings with people I would sit and I would sometimes ask them a obsessively large amount of questions just so I could get full scope and brief of what that person wanted and what the customer was so when I worked with a musician I asked them not who they like to be, look like, who they are, what they respond to, what their favorite loves are, you know, what their favorite colors are, all that kind of stuff. Treat it as if you're going on a date where you want to get loads and loads of information from someone. And then you take all the knowledge that you've applied and, and you sort of like, sell it back to them. In, but in your aesthetic, does that make sense? So if someone says, oh, I like grunge and I quite like the punk era and I'm into this, that and the other, I give them my interpretation of this because essentially they're coming to see, to do, for me to do what I do, but do it in their format. And I think it's marrying the two, but it's trial and error and it takes quite a while to get it. Um, yeah. Like some people don't get it at all and then other people do. I think working for loads of different people always helps as well. Um, I worked with loads of different brands. Like I worked with loads of different high street brands so I could kind of get that aesthetic down. I worked mm -hmm. a lot with um, loads of young magazines because I thought well, like youth culture is something that's really important to me. Um, yeah. And it's something that I respond to really well. So therefore I was able to do that. Um, I just kept my eyes and ears open and spent a lot of time talking to people wearing the things that I liked and how they wore them, you know? So like, you, if you're into skate culture, then you've probably got skate culture mates, see what they're wearing and how they're wearing it, Yeah. you know? Gosh, it's quite intimate, I suppose, because you're having to sort of yeah. like, deep into someone's kind of inner, like their values or their kind of history, but then not obviously keep a professional line between that. It's kind yeah. of- Styling is all about trust. And if, if you don't, if someone doesn't trust you, you, you actually just need to, for your own sanity and theirs, you kind of need to walk away from the project because it doesn't matter how, what I have. If I can't, if I have to sell you into yeah. something, then there's kind of no point in us doing it. You have to kind of really believe that I have your best interest at heart. Um, yeah, which is very brilliant. difficult to do in this climate, especially when you're sort of bombarded with images of how we should look mm. as women and how we should present ourselves. You know, if you're a young musician and you're tied to a label, labels want you to be, they, you know, they use sort of coded words like 
youthful. They mean sexy. Um, and if you don't want to be sexy, then you should be able to kind of go, that's not how I want to represent myself. This is, and work with people who do that rather than working with somebody who's trying to put you in a crop top. Like that's yeah. uncomfortable for everything. You're going to look uncomfortable. It's not, you're not going to get the pictures you want. It all has a detrimental effect. So it's mm. about, I think it's about you knowing who you are as an artist and them knowing who they are as an artist, marrying the two together and it making a bit more sense. That's really good. Um, do you think that's the thinking about that kind of level of trust and kind of the respect for each other? Um, is there any times where you've dressed someone and then afterwards you've thought, oh gosh, I really regret suggesting that? Is there anything you think in hindsight? You look back now, obviously trends change, but have you thought, oh my gosh, I'm yeah. I don't know what I was thinking, or did you have a glitch in the matrix or anything? Like I I don't know if it's because I'm really bullish. I'm really proud of the things I did. Sometimes I, sometimes I've appeased someone and I should have been like, no, you have to do this rather than making them feel comfortable. But some, because sometimes I will, I won't put you in a bad outfit, but if I, if you're not someone that wears heels, I'm not going to force you to wear a heel because then you're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to take a bad picture. It's going to look bad on me. But sometimes you need to say to somebody if their goal is, the, a certain way it's I've been in situations where an artist wants to dress a certain way and management wants to keep the record label happy but nobody wants to have this conversation with the artist so therefore I go in there being like I'm here to help you and we can do this mm -hmm. together but bearing mm -hmm. in mind they want this so do you want to go with this or do you want to go with that and like if you do like we'll do it together but yeah. I'm trying to team effort um but yeah, sometimes wow. it doesn't work. And then what normally happens is people automatically blame the stylist, then they don't work with me, then they work with someone else and the same thing happens again. And mm. you're like, you see, I'm not the problem. Yeah, <laughs> yes, the star of the show, <laughs> they're the problem. Yeah, it's, it's, very cool. it's, it's a hard one. It's, you know, people just kind of, I think in an industry where people, they they work, music is, is fun, but quite dangerous in terms of once one thing works, they apply that thing to everybody else. And I just don't think you can do that. It's not one size fits all. Um, yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Um, yeah. So another question, uh, how, how did you build or how to build a relationship with a magazine and pitch your first editorial? That's a good question. Oh God, persistence beats resistance. Um, I emailed Nylon possibly 30 times before they responded to one of my emails. Like, it was embarrassing. It was, it was like every single time, I'd be like, hi, my name's Jeannie, I'm around. Do, do, you, do you need anything? I could do something. And then one day out of the blue, they were like, can you be here at five o'clock to dress this person I'd never heard of um, and to be at this photographer's house I'd never heard of and can you bring some stuff? And I put loads of things yeah. in a duffel bag it they liked it and that was the end of it but had i not continuously emailed them i wouldn't have kind of gotten through and when people i think people get really sort of like oh they didn't get back to me i am inundated with emails and sometimes my brain can't really like function as to mm -hmm. what's going on my brain's a bit like ah oh, i don't or they'll, or they'll say they're gonna get back to it um like this a girl dm'd me and she dm'd me three different times off of three different accounts and i kept saying that i was going to get back to her and it's not until the third time i saw it i was like oh my god i was supposed to email you back but um it's yeah it's not because people are being mean it's because everyone's inundated with you know yeah i can barely remember to um do my favorite things like eat and sleep and watch <laughs> yeah because i'm constantly going through emails so yeah. um so yeah i think it's trying to sort of build relationships find find a bunch of magazines that you like reach out to them don't give up because mm. if you like you know all only, only the strongest people survive continue like I, it took me 10 years to kind of get to where i am now and had a, and every time I, like i would make think of these scenarios where i was going to quit and like you know i was like i you know quit and work in sports directs because i love i love tracksuits and i could just sell tracksuits and i like, have a nice time and like eat mcdonald's and like walk to work it's going to be chill and i'm telling you every single time i thought about that the next day i would be booked on a really great job and then i'd like my life again so <laughs> mm. it, it really is just trying to be consistent um, yeah listen to the universe the universe is still yeah. in the right path um just picking up on that Ginny do you think um when you sort of 
got into the industry obviously things have changed a bit now because it's everything's so focused on email but if you are pitching to a magazine with this email do you keep the emails short and sweet and do you put a pdf and links to your website is it kind of just all business or is it more like is it more pally is it more friendly your tone like how should people approach the um, pitch have you got any I I like people who have really good bodies of work like and I don't care where the work comes from if I like your idea sometimes it's not really about an idea because I think it's very rare for I've never pitched an idea and then the idea has been in the magazine what's normally happens is somebody's likes the things that I've done um and it doesn't matter how you do it it's like back to what I was saying if you can't find designers that you that will lend you clothes to shoot them for whatever and create a some sort of body of work it doesn't need to be loads of pages say you get 10 good images right that sort of describe who you are and what you're about then write somebody a really short paragraph show them your work before because pitching there's very rare situations where somebody pitches something to me and i go that's amazing i've never heard of that before we should do that um because that it just doesn't really work like that but if i like your work i bank your work and then what i normally do is that because I think that's a much more rewarding thing to do is when I have a project that works for you I contact you right. and I'll email somebody and go I was thinking about that picture that you did I can't get it out of my brain I have this project would you like to work on this mm. and I think that makes way more sense than just sending out like pdfs to people it, it, it doesn't feel special to me um mm. unless some, like once in a while somebody will send an absolute corker of an idea and then i'm like blown away but yeah. i can count those times on my hands most of the yeah. time it's people sending sending the same sort of stories because we see the same things and we act, we act in the same things yeah. so if you are gonna pitch you need to make sure that that story that's something that is a really 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 good idea um but that's if cool. not work on some personal projects. I think personal projects are amazing. If you're a photographer, um, maybe don't take pictures of people, take pictures of loads of different stuff, put it together in, and say, this is what I do. And then we can work on the people a bit later. Do you know what I mean? If you're a stylist and you've got a cute model friend, dress them up in your, your, your grand's clothes or something in a way that I've not seen before, send yeah. those pictures to me in a PDF and I'm much more likely to go, that person's got a really good, unique sense of style. I like how they use that. Cause I'm not looking for like, not looking for you to be look, wearing Prada look 23. I don't care about stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and I'm not looking for you to shoot a supermodel. I'm looking for how you interact with those pictures and to show me something that I've not seen before. Um, but that has it took me ages to get that so um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very keen to pass on that information now so you don't spend you know 10 years figuring it out too mm, it's the journey <laughs> isn't it that kind of it leads is. a bit to this question but um do you find inspiration in any other sources other than fashion and art i know you've picked up on being with friends and sort of visiting the gallery and stuff and with music it's everything it's books it's films it's art it's it's fashion um of late it's not been fashion i'm not not because i'm not i, I just think there's loads of things going on in the world so mm. talking about dresses sometimes feel a bit silly but if the dress makes me feel something that's incredible then, then i'm into it um but yeah it's why i don't do show reviews because <laughs> i'm like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um i you know like world events traveling i i think you can get inspiration from everywhere and everyone and i know that sounds really cliche but it's it's true yeah um, um cool as another question so beck has asked as a fashion textile designer graduating this year what are your recommendations for getting um your work out there with editorials publications shows meeting different labels any other advice you can offer so if you're a sort of a maker um, I guess in graduate. Yeah, I think cast the net really wide. Maybe make a list of places you want to work. Um, I would contact places like London College of, not London College of Fashion, British Fashion Council, see what they've got about. There's always weird little bursts and stuff like that. Um, Business of Fashion has got a really big database of fashion jobs um, that I think people don't utilise enough. And I think mm -hmm. go and go look at that because there's loads of weird little things that you could do that's creative um not as mm. i mean obviously it's not as creative as owning your own brand but you know you can go and do textile work or print design for loads of different people and and earn a living until you figure out what it is you want to do um i think that's always really good 
I yeah, I like when I wanted to work at magazines, I listed all the magazines I wanted to work at. And I tried to kind of contact them one by one. Um, send I sent like my CV on spec, but then anytime a job came up, I always sort of would apply for it. Mm-hmm. Um, like I would contact PR companies if you are doing, you know, if you're looking for someone to represent you, if you are thinking about if you're thinking about sort of like wanting to just make stuff and from the jump make money of it, then you know, see if you can find someone at a bursar or someone like the arts council definitely i think have like a little strand where they will give people money if you write a decent enough pitch about what you want to do and what you want to use the money for then you could set up your own e-shop and start that way um you know use marketing was within marketing with your friends and all that kind of stuff like just fingers in lots of pies i think throw everything at the wall and then see what sticks that's good advice Um, I guess because last week um, in, in the inspiration event we had Henry Holland talking to the, the participants and he said something quite similar like make your um, products global make sure you've got the right yeah. you know appeal to kind of like on Instagram anyone in the world could buy this certain piece or buy into this idea um, but also yeah. quite sustainable with the way you're doing it so don't put yourself in like I have these ideas all the time I'm really into like weird little slogans and me and the other day me and my friend were like maybe we should do a t-shirt brand I mean we've got jobs but we were just like it'd be quite funny to you know the slogans that we come up with we could put them on t-shirts and like have a second revenue income and you know there's a website you can go and do them from and you can get like sustainable t-shirts and put your little logo on them set up Mm. a you know an an Etsy shop or or something on Instagram and Bob's your uncle you're a business owner like it's if you 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 know there are definitely ways of doing it more now so than ever Mm. Um, and I think it's just a good way to kind of a teach yourself how to run as a business Mm -hmm. and um, before you are you know poached by bigger people and asked to do bigger things yeah but I think reaching out to to loads of different people I think is better rather than just kind of going I want to work at Prada so I'm just going to contact Prada you know Mm. I don't think that works these days yeah it doesn't I think you have to really um not be scared to approach people because everyone's been in this position and it's just it's like a the pecking order you just go through it P- people leave people move up that's kind oh, of oh yeah it's it's literally like it's kind of like a really weird bad long version of musical chairs the people that I've worked yeah, with here who are now directors we were all interns and we all used to just run around together not knowing what we we're doing yeah. um trying to figure yeah. it out I think it's just yeah don't circle of creativity yeah don't fear fear is such an unnecessary um emotion and it stalls a lot of things that you just don't need to be doing just yeah go for so good great advice um what are the best platforms do you need to socialize and network with stylists photographers and industry creatives so you mentioned instagram is there any others that you think more industry-led sort of different I- I like things like Dazed Fashion. Um, uh, what's the other? I think going on Dazed Fashion because they always put up loads of different people and loads of new designers and stuff like that is always good. Um, I think looking on colleges' um, Instagrams like London College of Fashion, CSM, um, Royal Arts, and all that kind of stuff, they will have a plethora of new designers that you can kind of get familiar with. Um, I know there's loads of Facebook groups that people still use. Um, where else is really good someone told me that discord is now setting up like some fashion led places um people are on clubhouse talking about fashion all mm. the time and loads of different aspects of it. um twitter to me is still the number one source of finding new people and different voices and different points of views i think that's really good i think if you're all over the place kind of just being like hey i'm here i want some help with this who wants to collab who wants to work together and mm that will lead you to sort of better situations, I think. And actually connecting all those sites, so you connect your Instagram to your Twitter so that you can share each and it all creates. Oh, I can't hear you as, as well. Hold on a second. Oh, sorry, Hello. is it my, um, and, and I was just saying about connecting all your social media together, Ginny. So like make sure and yes. the Twitter and it's all the same branding and all the same pictures and all the same sort of like, so it looks really focused is probably a good idea. I did actually yeah. join Clubhouse this week um yeah i don't know what it is but someone sent me a link so i'm going to try and figure that <laughs> i mean like some of it is actual hell but then there's other people like saying some really like smart things on there mm. um 
and I think it's quite good to kind of just just to be in communities and spaces where people are like-minded and also wanting to kind of get ahead and you know yeah work share on ideas things. yeah that's cool um I've just given a, a message to the team um watching just saying if there's any more questions to come in so we've got a couple more so are PR companies hesitant to loan samples if you're pitching shoot ideas or mood boards to magazines will they only sorry oops where have we gone will they only loan the clothes if you have a confirmed shoot and a pull letter yes they will um only because for every person who's just trying to get somewhere in the industry there are horrible horrible stories where people have borrowed clothes and never given them back um and i have heard of a couple of those i mean it sounds fucking crazy to me but there's been people who have gone said they're borrowing stuff for people for the mm. publications and sold them thousands of pounds worth of clothes and these samples are regardless of price one in the world so that means that one, once that sample's gone it's gone you can't get it again um and it sort of takes away the opportunity from sorry, everybody else so if i was you i would it's it's like it's annoying because it's like that thing, you know, when you, you didn't, you're 17 and you want a job, but you've never had a job before, but you need experience to have a job. It's kind of like that, which is really yes. annoying, which is why I'm always a bit like, just, you know, I think bite the bullet, go and get some vintage clothes and do that. So you mm -hmm. have some sort of ways of playing with those rather than trying to borrow it off of, of, off of PRs. Because I think PRs aren't are only going to respond to once you're signed up from a publication. Um, okay. So if you can get a publication to, you know, to do that, that's great. But if not, I would I would focus on on different ways of um, displaying that. Even like, so like, it's yeah. always like finding a designer that you liked and then being like, hey, I like your clothes. I have this concept for a shoot. Would you like to work to it together? You get pictures from your collection. I'm able to use the same pictures to do X, Y, and Z. And that yeah. kind of collab feels a little bit more realistic to me than just pitching to somebody and hoping someone will give you clothes. Because essentially mm -hmm. it's based on trust. Like I can get clothes from anywhere, but that's because I've been working in the industry for 10 years and people, and I've got a web, working website and you can see what I do for a living. But if you yeah. are just coming into it, why would, do you know what I mean? Why is Chanel going to lend you something? They don't know who you are. Um, mm. so you kind of have to think about it in that sense. Um, it, comes, it comes back to a bit about, you are saying styling is a lot about trust. But I guess one-to-one mm. -one with the person you're working with, but also with the with the designers or with the PR companies and stuff as well, just about showing what you'll do with that, how you'll communicate with those products. Um, thank you so much for this session, someone said. It's been really interesting and insightful. I'm just curious to know um, how someone with a background in history and research, as opposed to styling, can approach a brand to work with them on research and references. I think you have picked up on that, but any other kind of yeah. little bits of insight? I I mean the reason I did it is because I my my Instagram it's a bit weird I don't have like loads and loads of followers but the people who follow happen to work in the industry so what normally happens is they look they look at my Instagram and look at my references and they go oh she has a really good eye for references and that's yeah, yeah. how I get approached yeah um, that's what's been happening with me there's another there's another popular person who does what I do but in a different way and she didn't come from a styling background um i think her instagram's clo c underscore l underscore o and now she works as a creative director but she was putting up all of these like uh, amazing images um that she had found from all over so it could be yeah. like an ice cream cone like you know and a waterfall in brazil like you know a bit of carpet like all of this stuff and then because the feed was curated in such a strong visual way which i think is very hard to do on instagram because people caught on to it and now there's loads of people that do like there's loads of people that do what i do on my account they just don't do it the way i do it mm -hmm. so it's trying to find a way of doing something but in a in an interesting way where it pays attention to what you're you pay attention to it does that make sense yeah it's like a, a subjective identity or something it's kind of it's yeah. owning in that authorship so sort of because thing. obviously they're like you know i those image references aren't mine but the way i curate them is yeah um, it's they're interesting that they're, they're looking for they they want that curation so they're like i want someone who has you know i've got a bit of a passion for 
the late 2000s. I also have a really strong art history reference, you know, mm -hmm. along with, you, you could, people find it hard to determine my age because they're like, is she 14 or is she 56? What's going <laughs> on here? So, because it, because that's what the Instagram looks like. Um, but that's on the curation. And, and I spent so much time like kind of working on the curation of it that now it's identifiable. So when people see things like that, they're like, oh, okay. Um, I also set up two accounts. So there's one account that's like, so a much darker sort of version, which is which then turned into a magazine. Um, and that got lots of work from from it and then the other account is a little bit more light-hearted but it's still packed with lots of references in there it's interesting that you said at the beginning that you you'd set out after school to become a art curator and however you've evolved now you are curating but with fashion and all yeah. that in a context so it's kind of came full circle i guess with your I loved, I just loved, I loved, what I loved about art curation wasn't even necessarily the art. It was the way that you could trick somebody into looking at things in an order that you put in front of them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's really powerful. That means that you're telling the story, even though you didn't create the art. And I applied the exact same knowledge to my Instagrams. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, you're taking people down a path rather than, yeah. you know, them being, yeah, you're sort of leading somebody into seeing things the way you want them to see if that mm. it's really nice makes sense. and that sort of connects to this question about um is it better to have your own website or just put work online and uh, put your work online platforms like um behance and dots the dots so i guess i think something is it good to have your own url i think having your own website is really good because people will can kind of get lost and get more of a, an idea of what you're about um I think having I think having all of it really works. I think for a really long, weirdly for a really long time for me, people didn't know that I was a stylist. I thought that was stupid because I'm a bit like who's putting up references for willy nilly. But some people didn't get that until I. So then I was like, oh, I need to link my website. So now my left website is linked to my Instagram. So then when people go on the Instagram, they go, oh, that's why she's really good at references because this is what she does as a living for a living. Mm. And then they combine the two. And now it's like, you know, sometimes people will contact me for one, sometimes people will contact me for others. It will sort of, you know, it depends. I think kind of just having, I just think having as many visual spaces that are consistent of your message is beneficial. So people, you know, yeah. the way I tweet and the way I talk on Instagram, the way I interact on Tumblr, my website, all the same. All, all of it, all of it has the, the element of me. So people go, that is that person visually, socially, that's how that person works. Yeah, um, that's really Which cool. kind of, yeah, I think it means that when, and it sort of just stops, for me, I found it means that when brands want to book me, they're booking me for a reason, not just because I, you know, and they say explicitly say, we just want you to style things, which is also great. Um, yeah. But it's, yeah, it just, Found, I found it a little bit easier to be that consistent that people think of it as a brand or like a branding rather than just a person with you know some sort of multiple dis multiple disorder or something. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. um, we've got a few more like a couple more little punchy questions. So who do you go to for mentoring, Ginny? So who do you go to? You're obviously really successful and people know who you are. Ooh. Who do you go to for that um, feedback or that support? I, I force Katie to be my mentor. She doesn't want to, but I, I make her. <laughs> um, That's a pretty good I, one. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. Come on, tell me how to do it. Come on. Um, she, do you know what? She's really simple as well. She's like, you just do it until you, until it feels right. You just you keep doing it. Just keep doing it until it feels mm. right. And then I was like, th I was like, oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, Kate Phelan is another one mm. um, because I just think she's. I think to have such a lustrous career for such a long period of time um, amongst all yeah. the stuff that's happening. You know, stylists are like, people are just in and out all the time and Kate Phelan is solid and mm -hmm. all, like always delivers, you know? Um, yeah. I assisted her like very briefly and then was kind of like, I like you. So anytime I have a problem, I'm just gonna text you. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's, that's kind of what I do. Um, I have lots of other friends in the industry. So we all, 
we all sort of just get on the phone and cry together, basically. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Have a cry. Um, yeah. uh, so there's one more question that just came in, actually, um, from Chelsea. And they've said, um, sorry, I joined a little bit late, but I don't know if you've already asked this, answered this question, Jenny. I'd love to know what and who are your biggest fashion inspirations? Um, your ideas are so unique. That's really sweet. Oh, so, just people sure. like your icons or... <clears throat> um god what am my biggest fashion i i go back to the times when i was a kid and things that i was really blown away with and when i was really younger i was at point horror books um hype williams i thought hype williams videos were like insane mm. because i mean a they were so much money but i was just like it's like a dream but in real life i like couldn't understand how those things happened um and they always, I, I love imagery and, you know, like I like art that just makes me think and react. And I think about it over and over again. So if someone can do that, then I'm into it. I also love things that are really simple and situational. Like I was, a, I'm a really, not so much now, um, but I'm a really big fan of the Jurgen Teller. And that go-to series was incredible because it was like, you didn't know what the models were wearing. They're just bowling around on the street, but you remember those pictures like forever. Mm -hmm. Um, I love those. I love a bit of like, I love things like Venetia Scott. Like, I just think the way that she puts clothes together and the images that she takes are so intimate. Um, gosh, yeah, who else do I like? I just like, I like when people are captured in the best version of themselves. Does, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah, that's yeah, really a nice good. thing to sort of wind up on, actually, that, that what you said there. Um, oh, good. That was, that was a really great session. If there's no more questions coming through, um, Jeannie, just let us know what you're up to next. So you've got the, the publications coming out. Perfect Magazine comes out in March. It comes out in March. Um, I'm also, oh, next week I'm shooting for Harper's Bazaar USA, which is, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> so I'm yeah. about to, yeah, I can see my inbox filing up with emails so I have to go and deal with that um which is great I'm excited I'm really really excited um I think it's I, I haven't been on, been on set for like a couple of weeks and I, I've been missing it a lot because I've just been at home so it'd be yeah. nice to like touch some clothes um and there's going to be diamonds on set which is great so I'm going to try and not run off of them um, oh amazing like, that's incredible those are always fun, but yeah. So once I was shoot, I was working on a shoot with Katie, and we shot Kristen McMenemy, and a ring got stuck on her, and I thought we were gonna die because we couldn't get the ring off. Oh wow! <laughs> I, love I, that. I, I genuinely, sick. I thought we were gonna have to cut her, her finger off. I was like, <laughs> so it was, it was. Katie was like trying to wrench. Katie and Kristen were like in the corner, sort of rolling around on the floor trying to get this ring off. While I was there trying to stop the, the security guard who thought it was some sort of ruse. And I was like, mm. steal the ring and go where? We really want to give it back to you, but they they have to close. Um, they have to close vaults at five thirty, so they get really antsy. I um, see. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing. Stressful. I love the inside. I love the inside gossip. It's so cool. <laughs> So good. If that, if, do you know what? It made me so paranoid that every time I called in jewelry, I'd call it in from one place because I couldn't. I was like, "What if something happens?" And I would never call in rings because I thought they'd get stuck. <laughs> That's so good. Or go down to Argos and find a replacement. <laughs> like you know what I mean? I was like, I was at like, all. Oh, I I hated when they tell you the price of things. Oh, the job I did for they'd be like yeah so this ring this bracelet's 25 grand and you'd be like oh my god please stop <laughs> and there i would be like tossing it around like and then i'd forget and i'd be like oh my god what if i lost this that that's it so that good would be me. i love it well good luck with your shoot for harper's that's incredible that's and i Thank you. another one willing to happen waiting to happen and good luck with the launch coming up as well with perfect magazine super exciting oh, um, thanks so much for having me yeah, we have had so many people coming, lots of questions, lots of um, interaction and actual, um, just lots of nice comments that I'll share with you, Jeannie. Um, oh. If anyone wants to get in touch with you, the best to do that through your Instagram, I guess, like to DM yeah. you or yeah. send you, pop your message and you'll get back hopefully soon. I will, I will. I'm, I'm a bit stupid, so just like DM me, I will get it. <laughs> Promise. Jeannie, thank you so much. It was so brilliant to have you. We're really oh. glad you joined us and thanks to all the participants. Um, our next event is coming up in, I think, two weeks' time, so that's the 11th of March, 
and that is with the um, RuPaul's Drag Race drag queen Crystal from season one, who's doing the inspiration. Oh my god! Yes, yeah, oh. so good, so good, so good. So you need to join. Um, need to join and watch us on that journey. Um, and you can also sign up for a newsletter if you haven't already on the main website page. And we'll see you all soon. So thank you so much, everyone. Jeannie, thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you for having us.